Was Thomas Aquinas a master of spiritual theology? To answer this question, we must first offer a twin clarification. We must establish what we mean first by master and what we mean by spiritual or by that vexed term spirituality. Commonly in English, we regularly pair master with servant or slave. Reams of research, for example, have been written on the master-slave relationship. From this perspective, a master is one whom we must obey because he has power over us. There is, however, a countercurrent in English that preserves an older meaning of the word master. We speak of a master plumber or a master carpenter. There are also chess masters, and in the martial arts, there are masters of the martial arts. And in a unique uh, usage that many would consider quaint, to qualify to captain a ship in the merchant marine, one must become a master mariner, or what we call in the States a licensed master. According to this usage, Master connotes not so much dominion over another as expertise in a domain, a domain of knowledge. A master is one who has mastered a discipline, a disciplina, a paideia. This is also the primary meaning of magister in Latin. Indeed, the importance of this distinction becomes evident when we see how carefully Latin maintains it. In English translation, in the English translations of the New Testament, for example, by contrast, translators employ the term master sometimes to employ, uh, sometimes to translate didaskalos, teacher, and sometimes to translate curios, lord. Jerome, however, never does. He never employs magister to translate curios. Now, this may seem a picayune point until we see how it can influence, perhaps unconsciously, our understanding of what it means to be a master. For example, the RSV, the Revised Standard Version, a 20th century translation, it's a revision of the King James, the Revised Standard Version portrays Jesus as saying, truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, John 13, 16. But the Greek term here is not didaskalos, but kurios, Lord. Thus, Jerome translates it as dominus, and the King James Bible, faithful to the Greek, translates it as Lord. No slave is greater than his lord. In English, therefore, as in other European languages, there has arisen a confusion between mastery, mastery of a discipline, and authority over others. Might this confusion, confusion correspond to the rise of nominalism and voluntarism uh, in the academy? If the force of law depends not on the wisdom of the lawgiver, on his understanding of the way things are, but on the will of the lawgiver, then what counts is no longer knowledge and expertise, but power and authority. Inevitably, this leads to the aberrant situation where knowledge and expertise are no longer what count in the academy, but what post one holds in the academy. Likewise, with regard to the scholars of the past and their role in the curriculum, uh, it is no longer their wisdom that counts, but whether they are part of an imposed canon. In which way are we celebrating St. Thomas? In which way is St. Thomas a master for us? There was a time when fidelity to the teachings of Aquinas was imposed upon professors who weren't even allowed to disagree in public with Aquinas on the smallest points. 
It should not surprise us that institutions over which Thomas held this obediential form of mastery threw off the Thomistic yoke as soon as they could. Thomas himself, however, was forged in that older form of mastery, a mastery that tradesmen, thank God, and their guilds continue to cultivate, where what counts is knowledge of the way things are, knowledge of their discipline. Plumbers need to know plumbing or they will never make a living or avoid causing septic disasters uh, in the dwellings of their clients. Carpenters need to know carpentry or they will never build a house that stands. And ship's captains need to know their trade and the waters they ply to avoid coming to shipwreck. This contrast is thus not superficial. It is not a matter of etiquette or of being nice. It concerns the true source of moral and spiritual authority. The word that binds, the word that leads us like a master leading his disciples, is a word grounded in wisdom. It draws us to follow it, to celebrate its speaker as a master, because it is a word of wisdom and not merely an expression of will. This is the mastery we celebrate in Thomas Aquinas. If he is still relevant after 700 years, it is because of his mastery over the discipline that we call the Christian life. He is a true magister spiritualis. But at this point, another objection arises. Granted that Thomas Aquinas had a profound knowledge of, the, of Christian doctrine, aren't we violating the Lord's evangelical command when we call Thomas a master? Do not be called masters, for you have one master, the Christ, Matthew 23.10. Thomas Aquinas himself uh, responds to this objection by affirming that the Lord, quote, does not prohibit the act of teaching or of employing the name of the teaching office, magisterium, but ambition for this office. Thus, the Glossa Ordinaria, whom Tom, which Thomas quotes, interprets the Lord's words to mean, do not desire to be called master. Although Thomas offers a further precision the Lord, quote, does not condemn all such desire, but only inordinate desire. Thomas portrays this desire as a longing to participate in the mastery of Christ, which Thomas presents in relation to the spiritual life. Thomas once again quotes the Glossa Ordinaria to explain that, quote, God is called both father and master by nature while man is called father by bestowal and master by ministry, ministerio. Thus, Thomas explains, quote, what the Lord forbids is that someone attribute to a man the authorship, autoritas, of natural life and of spiritual life or even of wisdom. Wisdom and life, both natural and spiritual, come from God. It is by participating in this divine creativity, this divine authorship, that one merits the title father or master. Quote, we honor someone with the title master because of his association, consortio, with the true master, treating him as an envoy, nuncius, out of reverence, for the one who sends him. Thomas, therefore, was a master who participates in the mastery of Christ, who, by nature, is the master of the spiritual life. This leads us to our second question. What do we mean by spiritual and spirituality? After the Second World War, scholars began self-consciously to give attention to this curious feature of theology the emergence of the term spirituality and of the domain of spiritual theology. 
The Italian medievalist Gustavo Vinay, responding to the growing popularity of the term spirituality, spoke for many when he exclaimed, Che cosa è dunque questa spiritualità? What is, therefore, this spirituality? Walter Principe, who 40 years ago responded to Vinay's call to formulate an answer to his exasperated question, drew on the historical work of Jean Leclerc to delineate three different but related uses of the term. First, there is what Principe calls the real or existential level, describing it as the lived quality of a person. Spirituality in this sense is, quote, life in the spirit as brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ and daughters and sons of the Father, unquote. One refers here to a specific person's spirituality or their spiritual life. Next, the second sense of spirituality refers to, quote, the formulation of a teaching about the lived reality, often under the influence of some outstanding spiritual person, unquote. Principe has in mind here either the writings of the saints, uh, such as Teresa of Avila or Ignatius of Loyola, or hagiographies that portray the life and deeds of a particular saint as a model of Christian living, such as the early biographies of Francis of Assisi. This is spirituality as practical teaching about how to live the Christian call to holiness. At this level, we refer to Francis's or Teresa's spirituality, meaning their spiritual teaching. Lastly, Principe discerns a third and final use of the term to mean, quote, the study by scholars of the first and especially the second levels of spirituality. Principe affirms that this sense of spirituality refers to, quote, a discipline, a university academic discipline, using the methods and resources of several other branches of knowledge, unquote. If we accept Walter Principe's threefold division, where does that leave us concerning St. Thomas and our initial question? If we turn to the primary existential level, there seems to be no difficulty. The fact that Thomas was canonized, the very thing we are celebrating, points to his being a spiritual master in this primary sense. He lived the Christian life and did so in an exemplary way. But what about the other two levels? Was Thomas a spiritual writer like Teresa of Avila or Ignatius of Loyola? Does he have a spirituality in this sense? Or was he more someone who engaged in the academic study of the lives and writings of the saints? When we pose the question this way, we discover that Thomas does not really seem to fit in either category. He never wrote a treatise on the spiritual life the way St. Vincent Frere, a hundred years later, would. Nor did he undertake studies of the lives and spiritual writings of the saints. He simply wrote theology. Now, we can delineate what that is, but I'd prefer to put that into brackets. So does this mean that St. Thomas was not a master of spiritual theology? Or is there a problem with Principe's threefold division? at least as it refers to Thomas and the scholastics of his generation? Are we perhaps trying to pour medieval wine into Baroque wineskins? Stated another way, are we perhaps trying to sing medieval hymns with Baroque settings and orchestration? Michel Labordet, after masterfully, masterfully sketching what we, call, we could call a Thomistic understanding of the spiritual life, asks the embarrassing question, but why call the study of this, of this domain spiritual theology? Why not just call it theology? Quote, shouldn't we simply call it theology or at least moral theology, that part of theology that specifically concerns the rational creature's return to God? For what reason should we have a special course on this subject, distinct from an expository course, 
on the Summa Theologiae. Now remember, Labordet famously has his multi-volume commentaries on the secunda pars of the Summa. Why not just do that? Why have a special course on spiritual theology? In considering the extent to which spiritual theology is distinct from moral theology, Labordet recognizes that, quote, a good number of Thomists absolutely refuse to admit the legitimacy of such a distinction. And Labordet concedes that, quote, and I love this quotation, the way this distinction is often presented fully justifies their refusal. Nevertheless, Labordet convincingly argues for the utility of the distinction between spiritual theology and moral theology when properly understood. Labordet is not alone in this. Father Servet Theodore Pinkers, who was himself wary of the distinction, nonetheless sees the value of it once we properly understand the nature of moral and spiritual theology. For both Labordet and Pinkers, the root of the problem stems from an impoverished moral theology. Father Pinkers uh, narrative of this impoverishment is well known, especially for those who have read the sources of Christian ethics. It is a narrative that marks the transition from biblical, patristic, and high scholastic conceptions of the moral life to the Baroque and manualist portrayal of it. So I say Baroque because the Baroque period starts around 1600. We have Shakespeare writing his plays. We have Baroque music here in Rome, but you also have uh, Juan Azor's uh, multi-volume uh, first ever manual of moral theology that starts to be written in 1600. Okay. So um, the transition from biblical patristic high scholastic conceptions of the moral life to Baroque and manualist portrayals of it. With the rise of nominalism, with its impoverished understanding of both of nature and of grace, and voluntarism with its shift from wisdom to will, the manuals of moral theology no longer present human action in, rela in relation to human flourishing, both natural flourishing and as elevated by sanctifying grace, nor in relation to the traits of character, the virtues, both infused and acquired, that promote it. Instead, the, the manuals of moral theology analyze human action in relation to law, as an expression of the will of the lawgiver. This does not mean that, the Baroque, that Baroque theology had no place for grace and the spiritual life, but they studied these realities outside the domain of moral theology. The treatise on grace shifted to do dogmatic theology, while the life of grace became the domain of ascetical and mystical theology. It is during this period Scholars trace it to the 17th century in France, and a very recent study that's coming out soon, I got the, the proofs for it, uh, this year's uh, Randall professor at Providence College is publishing it, uh, and tracing it to uh, the 16th, all the way back to 16th century in Spain. So whether it's the 17th in France, 16th in Spain, the uh, scholars begin to employ the term spiritual theology and to give a new meaning to spirituality uh, at this time. Father Pinker sees the work of the Sulpician educator, Pierre Pourha, who was uh, the, the rector, he was rector at the Grand Seminaire de Lyon in France, and author of La Spiritualité Chrétienne des Origines de l'Église au Moyen-Âge, published in 1919. So Father Pinker see, sees Pourha's study as perfectly expressing the Baroque vision of moral and spiritual theology. So here's a quote. Spirituality is that part of theology that treats Christian perfection and the paths that lead to it. There is dogmatic theology, which treats what we should believe, and moral theology, which teaches what we should do and avoid in order not to sin mortally or venially. And above these, but based upon them, there is spirituality or spiritual theology. Dogma thus teaches us what we should believe. Morals teaches us how, 
to avoid sin. And then there is spirituality, which is based on but superior to both of them. Abbe Pura subsequently explains that spirituality is divided into uh, aesthetical theology and mystical theology. Aesthetical theology, he affirms, considers, quote, the exercises that every Christian who aspires to perfection should undertake. And he underlines that, quote, God invites us to do them and gives us the necessary graces that enable us to respond to his invitation. In contrast, mystical theology studies, quote, extraordinary states, such as mystical union properly so called, and its associated manifestations, namely ecstasy, visions, and revelations. Pura explains that while aesthetical theology studies what we, uh, what we, aided by God's grace, can do to, quote, raise ourselves towards God, Mystical theology studies phenomena, quote, that do not depend on those who experience them. Instead, quote, it is God who suddenly and impetuously invades the soul. Now, there are several things to note here. First, how fragmented a picture of the Christian life this Baroque vision presents. The object of faith is separated from the act of belief. And there is no reference to belief as animated by charity as being the very heart of the spiritual life. Second, moral theology as the study of what all Christians are required to do is merely the study of how to avoid sin. In other words, it studies how to obey the commandments. On the other hand, Spiritual theology seems only to concern an optional call to perfection. It is not a command, but a counsel, something that God invites us to do and to which those who seek profession, perfection respond to. But it is not an obligation of all the baptized. Notice also how it assumes that avoiding sin, obeying the commandments, seems to have nothing to do with the life of grace, as if such obedience were possible without charity. Lastly, the division between ascetical and mystical theology, with its associated distinction between active contemplation and passive contemplation, occludes the heart of the spiritual life, which is friendship with God, where the give and take between our actions and the Lord's actions are part of an intimate colloquy of love, that more has the character of an apprenticeship with an interior master than as with, uh, as with we see with the apostles, uh, and that entails a give and take, a conversation, not easily understood when divided between ascetical and mystical aspects of one's life. Servet Pinker has devoted his entire academic life to healing this division and to reintegrating all the aspects of theology that Thomas presents in the secunda pars of the Summa Theologiae, reintegrating them all into moral theology. He thus defined moral theology as, and this is Pinker's definition directly from the French, the English translation has a few problems. The branch of theology, so moral theology, according to Father Pinker's, is the branch of theology that studies human acts so as to order them to the loving vision of God our true, complete happiness, and our final end, by means of grace, the virtues, and the gifts, in light of revelation and reason. Upon effecting this reintegration of all the elements of the Christian life into the domain of moral theology, one might legitimately ask, why maintain the division between moral and spiritual theology? why not simply portray St. Thomas as a master of the Christian life and leave it at that? This is where both Labordet and Pinkers recognize that although Thomas Aquinas is a master of the spiritual life, he is so primarily on the level of principles. He articulates the principles of spiritual theology initially in the Prima Secundae of the Summa Theologiae, more deeply in the Secunda Secundae, and especially in 
his biblical commentaries, especially on Paul and his masterpiece, the commentary on the Gospel of John. It is there that he underlines that the entire spiritual life depends on charity and its growth in the, and that growth in the spiritual life is growth in the stages of charity. And that this charity is a communion, a koinonia, a communicatio in the divine life, the triune life of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that gives charity the character of a friendship, an intimate friendship with God. This intimacy is lived in the Spirit, and thus we call it life in the Spirit and the spiritual life. All of these uses are found in Aquinas. Christ, however, as God incarnate, is, and there's another quote uh, from the Tertia Pars, question 34, article 1, Christ is perfecta spiritualitas. He's the perfection of spirituality, God incarnate. And therefore, life in the Spirit is necessarily life in Christ. This intimacy is so great that Christ becomes our life, an allusion to St. Paul. And to explain St. Paul's affirmation, Thomas uh, appeal is one of the rare times when he appeals to his own background. Uh, just as some call hunting or friendship with a certain person their life, because it is their passion for hunting or communion with their friend that moves them to act and guides all that they do, so too, quote, Christ is our life, because the whole principle of our life and activity is Christ, unquote. St. Thomas does, in this sense, have a spiritual theology, although he never calls it this. The object of this theology is the study of the stages of one's growth in charity, which occurs in the Spirit and through an apprenticeship with Christ, in whom we become by adoption what he is by nature, sons and daughters of the Father. For him, as for Labordet and Pinkers and the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the spiritual life is the vocation of all the baptized. It's not an option. The call to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect is a command. We are not, perfection is not commanded at the beginning, but it is the goal of all of us. St. Thomas does not, however, offer an existential account of the stages of growth. He never, virtually never, uses the first person singular. He hides his own experience. He sketches the stages, but he does not develop them. He has a spiritual doctrine, but what he offers is an introductory course. As the humble friar from Rocaseca, he pulls a veil over his own life and experiences, making the words of Isaiah his own, secretum meum mihi. This is where other saints and other epochs in the church's life have a role to play. Nevertheless, with St. Thomas sketching the principles, we can indeed say that he is a master of spiritual theology. Thank you.